I'd like to welcome everybody uh, tonight to, uh, to our really uh, first indoor in-person meeting since COVID, which is pretty exciting. Hopefully we'll all stay nice and healthy. But uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, uh, to this and uh, hope your uh, mushroom hunting uh, this year has been modestly successful at least. Uh, and finding we've uh, had some pretty good, uh, pretty good attendance in the forays, and with some pretty good success, I think, in in finding uh, some mushrooms. And we've got a few forays yet to go before uh, before the Minnesota winter sets in and kind of puts a stop to us. So, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce our speaker tonight. We're really privileged to have uh, Rick Bunyard. Uh, speak to us uh, about uh, Amanitas and uh, and about his uh, his book uh, all about North American Amanitas. Am I speaking correctly, Britt? Yes. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So I'll uh, I'll let uh, Britt uh, get right to it and look forward to hearing uh, on his discussion here. Uh, and presentation about Amanitas of North America. Thank you so much, and thank you to our Zoom attendees. I'm uh, pleased to say I hope that our uh, hybrid uh, type meeting uh, goes well uh, tonight, that our Zoom members, our Zoom attendees can enjoy it as well. So. The mic continues to make weird sounds like it'll just shout without it. You know, just too close to something. Else. I think so. Okay, so let's get started. Thanks for the introduction. And this will take, uh, I asked John to make sure how much time I had. And John said, I said 60 minutes was okay. He said, absolutely not. You can't go over now. So this will be just one hour, not 60 minutes. So it's uh, at 8.15. That's not too late. Now. Okay. So um, the talk tonight will be about Ammonitas of Minnesota and the North Woods. Uh, but first, a couple of shameless ads, one for the Ammonitas book, which uh, if you, after the presentation, decide you want a copy of the book, I have them here for uh, very cheap. The company price is 60 bucks, but I have them here for 40 bucks. The other shameless ad is for another book, which I do not have here tonight. And this is a book that I just published recently by Princeton University Press. And the reason I don't have any copies is because uh, it's actually been selling really quickly and they've had a tough time getting bulk copies to me, which is sort of a good problem to have. But by punching in this discount code BUM30, that's listed there, listed right there. So, um, and it's delivered in like three or four days and uh, I'm going to be pleased with that. I've gotten pretty much good feedback from it. So, okay, on with the show. Tonight's presentation will be about Ammonitas, and we'll discuss uh, some basics about what Ammonitas are and how to know Ammonitas, uh, talk about some of the groups of Ammonitas that are in the area, certainly not all of them, and we'll mostly touch on some of the more popular groups like the Vaginata types and the Caesar types and the Lacaria types, etc. Uh, a little bit about their life cycle and taxonomy, and also I'll point out uh, species of Ammonitas to uh, look, be able to look out for that might be not that common around here, but they should they should be found around here. So uh, stay and watch. So first things first, does this does this group say uh, Ammonitas or Ammonitas or Ammonitas or Ammonitas as they say? Okay, so um, there's there's no real correct way to pronounce it. You can say it any way you want. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> So you can you can pronounce uh, the name any way you want. Don't let people tell you that you're wrong because uh, both ways that we say it is actually not the correct way to say it. So as long as everyone knows what you're talking about, <laughs> Ammonitas or Ammonitas, I usually say Ammonitas. Uh, either way is totally fine. What we can for sure agree on is is that they're beautiful. Uh, unlike a lot of other groups of mushrooms, Ammonitas are uh, usually quite large and showy. Many of them are quite common and always turn up at mushroom forays during the mushroom season and fairs and things like this. 
things like the muscaria types and the caesars there's some of the showiest mushrooms of all so it doesn't matter what you call them if you want to call them destroying angels or flying eric's or whatever uh, for sure they're a very charismatic group of mushrooms the other thing is when people find them they're usually pretty happy because they're big and showy everyone's in a good mood when they find out which ammonite is there's parades around the world where people dress as ammonite is i just came from the telluride mushroom festival and everyone in the parade dresses like ammonites well not everybody but almost everybody and of course muscaria for years and years was the one everyone wanted to dress as Nowadays, people are even getting into the act of dressing as other species of Amanita, which is really cool. So things like the Caesars and, of course, stink horns and other things, too. So, so, so no matter what, people get really excited when they see Amanitas. So a couple other things to note about Amanitas before we, I mention a few uh, details about how to know Amanitas from other mushrooms. And by the way, if you're a beginner, don't worry. This talk is definitely for you. It's mostly pretty pictures. Uh, nothing technical. It, uh, some people like total beginners and just getting started. Mm -hmm. So there's there's some hands going up, but there people are kind of like looking around, like I don't want to raise my hand. But probably half the people in the audience are probably beginners. So this will be uh, a good talk for you. It's very basic stuff. So um, the first thing to know about Ammonitis is when you pick up a guidebook to any any group of mushrooms or all the mushrooms. No matter who the author is, at the very beginning, it usually says the first group you should really learn is the group of Ammonitas. And this is because this is the, the group that most notoriously poisons and kills people uh, the world over. So 90 to 95 percent of all mushroom related fatalities in the world are caused by just a few species of Ammonitas. No other group of mushrooms has such dangerous mushrooms, and not even close. Having said that, no other group. Uh, of mushrooms has as many species collected as food as Ammonitis too. There's lots and lots of edible species and they're very popular and I'll show you a couple in just a second. But the thing about Ammonitis is um, there's some other mushrooms that can look like them. So they can be mistaken and that's what often leads to poisonings. So here's one group that looks kind of like Ammonitis and you'll say at first, it doesn't really look anything like an Ammonitis. First of all, it's coming out of wood and also the gills are kind of a pinkish color. This is a Pluteus. But if you look at the overall features and the stem and everything, it looks, it looks kind of like an ammonite. Some others in this group of mushrooms, like Fulveriella, also coming from wood, also has pink spores, unlike ammonites. But also looks even more like ammonite. It has a big vulva here, like a lot of species of ammonite. And then also in this same group is the vulva pluteus, which is kind of in between the Fulveriella and the pluteus. And I mean, to me, when they're immature, like these guys here, these are dead ringers for destroying angels. In fact, this photo was taken at my farm where we used to live in Wisconsin on the day of our annual Wisconsin Mycological Society summer picnic, and this was fruiting in wood chips that was right next to my driveway. I took away this mature one that has pink gills, which would be a giveaway. Took that one away and had the rest here out for all the members to see, and they were all fruiting, and you could even see the little baby egg. Some dead ringer for Ammonites. Everyone's coming over and ooh and on, ah, and the, the, we were talking about Peter and Colleen Bavisca. They were there. Everyone's wondering what these Ammonites are because there's no tree anywhere near this. It's so mysterious because Ammonites grow with trees. They're mycorrhizal for the most part. So they're like, well, what is this? I'm like, okay, here comes the big reveal. So I brought out the mature one and placed it down here, and someone's like, oh my gosh. The Ammonitas have pink spores. <laughs> I was like, okay, um, let's let's go back to like square one here. So this is actually actually a vulva pluteus, and the reason these guys look pretty similar to Ammonitas overall is because they're actually close relatives. If you look at the phylogenetic tree here, and this is really the only technical slide you're going to see today, so don't run for the doors just yet. But if you look at the phylogenetic tree of all the fungi, here's a couple things just to point out. So the Ascomycete group down here. It includes things like morels and yeasts and stuff like this, truffles, that's the way seeds. They come from a common ancestor that during evolution split, uh, the Ascomycetes split from the city of my seeds at a common ancestor. The ancestor was about 500 million years ago, quite a long time ago. So within the Basidiomycete group, and you will see these mushrooms at forays every time you go with this club foray, you'll see things like chanterelles and polypores and rushless. These are the oldest groups of mushrooms. These came on the scene uh, many, several hundred million years ago. About a hundred million years ago or so, 
excellently ugaric degrees that came along, including Ammonitis and some of the more recent things, uh, Psilocybe and Agaricus and Port Marius, etc. But if you look at this, this branch here, that Ammonita family, its closest relatives are the Pleurotaceae and the Pluteaceae, but I was showing you pictures of the Pleurotus types, the Pleurotus, Bulbariella, and Bulba Pluteus. So they're closest relatives, and that's why they look pretty similar. And in fact, just a few years ago, um, someone doing research on Ammonitis came with a really amazing, elegant study that found out why a few species of Ammonita don't seem to grow with trees. All the rest are mycorrhizal and grow with trees. And so what was found is that in these few species of so-called free-living Ammonitas, they uh, have the ability to degrade cellulose. And in fact, uh, looking at the genes within those species, they found three different gene groups that all other uh, saprobic mushrooms have for digesting cellulose and breaking down organic matter. So that's kind of cool, but what was even more cool was when they looked at all the other Ammonitas, they also had some of the genes to break down cellulose, but not all of the genes that are necessary. So what this led them to conclude is when Ammonitas split from Pleurotus, from other saprobes, it, it, it happened probably one time initially whereby one lost the ability to break down cellulose, and maybe that guy went extinct because it, it, it couldn't feed itself. And maybe it happened again, another mutation. Eventually, someone had a mutation, lost the ability to break down cellulose, and somehow glommed onto a plant, probably as like a parasite, maybe a mild parasite, and over time, this mild parasitism becomes a mutualism, and then they both become partners. And that's probably what begat all the rest of the Ammonitis that are all mycorrhizal probably from that single episode. Isn't that pretty amazing? And in fact, what's more amazing than that, and, and hard to believe, is that as people look at more and more groups of mushrooms that are all known to be mycorrhizal, they, you know, like farm trees and other plants, rushulas, bolides, uh, I mean, you could name pretty much any group, they find a species or two that has the ability to function somewhat separately. So when you see rushulas coming out of rotting logs, Cortinarius sometimes coming out of rotting logs, some, some bolides coming out of rotting logs. The, the reason for that has always been that, well, you know, when it gets kind of dry, these fungi, the mycelium comes up into this rotting wood and it's a moisture source, and that's probably what's going on there because, I mean, it's mycorrhizal, it can't break down cellulose, except that they can break down cellulose. And why shouldn't they? They could break down cellulose, they could get some nutrition there and supplement, you know, if they're getting uh, living as a, a mycorrhizal type. Anyways, that's kind of astounding to me. That's one of the hot areas of, of research right now. Anyways, so this is the story of where Ammonitis began. They began with a species that was a very close relative with Pleurotus types, I mean Pluteus types, and then you got all the rest of the mycorrhizal types. So when we look at the, uh, so again, here's the Pluteus family up here, and then here's the Ammonita family here. When we break down the family of Ammonita, we have two, two genera. The genus Ammonita and this other weird little genus Limacella. Anyways, Ammonita is broken down into seven sections. So the whole point of this is that there's a lot of species of Ammonita, hundreds of species. And you might not necessarily know which species you have. And a lot of times, nobody knows. It's, it's an un, undescribed species. However, it's actually very easy to know which section it belongs to. And so that should uh, satisfy you, being able to know uh, which species of the genus it is, but also to know if it's poisonous or not, maybe what its lifestyle is, etc. And we'll, we'll talk about these in the rest of the show. So one of the things about um, Ammonitis, why I like studying them, is because you don't have to have a microscope to be able to figure out which Ammonita you have. Ammonitas are big and showy mushrooms, and they have pretty much all the different parts that mushrooms can have. So they have a cap and a stem, oftentimes a ring and gills underneath, very oftentimes a cup at the bottom, and a lot of them are, are showy, bold colors. There's some drab ones too, and whites and some brown ones, but there's a lot of showy colors, so it's kind of easy to know what you have. So here's something else to look for when looking at ammonites. So when they start out, all of the ammonites, when they start out, they start out as a little tiny baby mushroom that scientists and everybody actually pretty much calls an egg, because it looks kind of like a little egg. And it's surrounded by a, a membranous veil that covers the entire mushroom that's called a universal veil. There's also a little veil that covers the immature gills, and you can't necessarily see it so easy here, but it's here. It's called a partial veil. As the mushroom uh, matures, the stem elongates and breaks that universal veil, 
part of that universal veil will be at the bottom of the mushroom as a cup called a vulva. And, and the part on the top could be scales, warts, or maybe a single patch, or maybe it falls off altogether. That's where these structures come from. So think of like an ammonite muscaria. Why does it have these scales on the top? Well, this is why. Those are the patches from that universal veil. When the captive opens and expands to reveal the gills, it'll break that partial veil that's covering the gills, and that's what's going to leave a ring on the stem. So these are all features to look for um, when you're out collecting mushrooms. One other note. If you're a beginner and you have a mushroom, uh, like a beginner guide, and you want to start eating wild mushrooms, they usually recommend the so-called foolproof four. Things like morels and shaggy manes and chicken of the woods and puffball. Because you can't really mistake any of those for anything that's dangerous. Except maybe sometimes you can. So if you have a puffball, there's, there's really large species of puffballs and there's some that are quite small. And all the books will say, if you slice your puffball in half and it's white, all the way through, it's totally safe to eat in North America, if it's white. As they mature, they can get kind of green and bushy and then form spores, and then that's kind of gross, and you wouldn't want to eat it. If you slice your, your puffball in half, and there's a baby mushroom inside, it's not a puffball. So it could either be a, an ammonita, or it could be a stink worm. So something to know. Um, then after maybe one season, you can move on to eating good mushrooms and you don't have to eat crap or like mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the definition of ammonitis. So you'll see a lot, and I point this out for a couple of reasons. Uh, they have white spores. That's not very helpful. A lot of mushroom groups have white spores. But a couple things to note. So most mushroom books say that they are mycorrhizal and occur with trees. I already mentioned that's not always true. Some species don't occur with trees and they can live free living. The other thing is that um, some books mention how sometimes there's a presence of a, a vulva. Uh, this is not true. All ammonites, by definition, have a vulva. The vulva may only be like little powdery pieces at the bottom of the stalk or whatever, but by definition, all of them have a vulva. And note the spelling, V-O-L-V-A. On Facebook, I see it spelled other ways, and assuredly, that anatomical feature is not in a mushroom. <laughs> so just, it's important to note these sorts of things. Uh, free gills. Uh, Ammonitis, besides having a white spore print, usually the gills are white, but not always. The Caesar group can have a yellow gills, but they're still going to be kind of pale color. And you'll see these when we get to them. Anyway, so this is sort of the definition of ammonitis. And one other thing, when you slice them in half, some groups are solid in the center and some are hollow. So Caesars and vaginata types are hollow in the center. So I can tell you this for sure is not a deadly ammonite, just, just by looking at this little baby here. Stuff. Okay, so as, as I mentioned, um, a walk in the woods during mushroom season, you'll find ammonites, and they can come in all sorts of different colors and shapes. This was a picture that I took a few years ago in Missouri, and I show this because in uh, upcoming here really soon is going to be the the annual the big north american foray in missouri and this is the kind of stuff you'll see if the mushrooms are out and they should be uh, by walking five minutes in the woods all of these are ammonitis and look how dramatically different each one is from the other there's deadly uh, there's deadly mushrooms here and totally safe at the on the table out there there was some ammonitis that we collected at a rest stop where we on the way out we stopped for five minutes and there was lots of them around one's a deadly destroying angel and the, the others on the table are totally edible so anyways uh, makes it easy to figure them out. Here's one other thing. When you're trying to figure out ammonites, and frankly any group of mushrooms that's new to you, uh, the, the club members will probably mention this when you go on forays, but it's worth repeating. When you see mushrooms for the very first time and you're not sure what it is, uh, don't grab the mushroom, don't slice it off, dig up the entire mushroom. With ammonites, this is the most important part. You probably thought the top of the cap is because you can see the color. Turns out it's actually the bottom of the stem is the most important part for figuring out which species of ammonite you have. If you were to merely have taken a knife and sliced all of them up, just see how kind of similar they would look if you just had the mm -hmm. cap versus the base of the stem, how dramatically different they are. So sacking vulvas, some species have, which can be like a boot. The vulva can be kind of crumbly and fall apart like these guys, or the vulva can merely be rings of tissue like on an ammonite muscaria or this guy here, or it can be almost not present at all at least not noticeable, it's just a little powder on the base, but oftentimes the base can be deeply rooting, etc. You wouldn't have seen that if you just cut them with a knife. So this is very important. So why do they have these features? What's with the scales and the warts and the, the bumps? Why is there a basal, you know, big base on some species and not? 
Here's why. This cartoon's in the Ammonitis book, and it came from my friend Jeffrey Kibbe, who's uh, a famous mycologist in Britain, and he runs the journal Field Mycologist. And by the way, if you've never seen him before, his first time back to North America in many, many years will be next summer at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. So really excited to be coming back. He's, he's one of the super brains of yeah. the mushroom world. So anyways, section Ammonita, this is the group that contains Ammonita muscaria, you know, the most known mushroom on the planet. Everyone knows what that mushroom is. So this is why they look like they do when you see them mature. Again, it starts out as a little egg, little baby mushroom. The stem starts elongating, but with this group of mushrooms, unlike some of the others, the elongation happens sort of at the top of, the, of this basal bulb, so that as the stem gets long, most of the basal bulb is still left behind and results in having a big fat base on it. So the stalk gets tall. As the cap expands, this vulva breaks and leaves scales on the top, and then also even scales, you can see here on green, there's rings of tissue here. The partial veil in red in all of these cartoons, as it breaks, it leaves a ring on the stem. One other thing to note here is section vaginati. This is the biggest group of, of uh, the genus. You'll see lots and lots of grisette type ammonitas, and there's several different ones on the table outside. All books always say uh, section vaginati, the grisette group, tawny grisettes, things like this. They're very common. You'll see them. Um, don't have a partial veil. That's wrong. They do have a partial veil. You can see in the cartoon right here. What's true is they don't have a ring, but they do have a partial veil. It's just that when the, when the cap breaks, the partial veil doesn't leave a ring coming off the side here. The partial veil collapses against the stem, and that's why you have this sort of like rattlesnake skin on some species or other colors. The grisettes are really cool. They often have really tall gray seal stalks, and a lot of times very much variable colors on them. They're really pretty. But usually just the stalk is the pretty part. And that's why, because this partial veil collapses against the stalk. And it's oftentimes a different color or a different uh, sheen or a different hue of color than the rest of the stalk. And I have some pictures of them as well. And if you want to see some up close and personal, there's several on the table outside. Okay, so uh, this is an overview of what these sections look like. So section M and I includes the panthers and the muscarioids and the gematoids. Very familiar with everyone. The Caesar group, uh, Caesars. Often very colorful mushrooms, but they always have a white bulb at the bottom. The grisette group or the vaginati, they look a lot like the Caesars. They often have a cup, but they'll have no ring, and they're close relatives, of course. And then the other subgenus, the other half of the genus, are these four groups here. And we'll mention a couple of these tonight, but especially section phylloidae, which includes the death cap species and the destroying angels. And this is a group you should uh, for sure know. It's a small group. But uh, they're very well known because they're deadly and infamous and they're, they're super commonly seen, especially like right now through uh, the end of fall. Okay, so starting with the uh, section Ammonita, this is the muscarioid types and the pantheroid types. A couple things to show you here and how to know uh, one from another. We certainly have several of these species in the, in the Midwest. Our muscari out here, Ammonite muscari, is variety Gesellii. It's this more yellow looking form, sometimes kind of orange in the center. It always has those white uh, warts on the cap. It can be completely white or even cream color. Very, very rarely it can be the red color that you would see from the Rocky Mountains to the west. But it's, it's still a variety of just so A um, couple things to note. When the vulva is encircling the little baby mushroom, it's yellow. So when it breaks, the scales first look yellow as they shrink, you know, as they get smaller and smaller, then they take on more of a, a white appearance. But the edges of them will still be yellow. In fact, the ring is attached to that universal veil as well. That's why it has this yellow band on it here. You can't see the basal bulb here, but there would be some rings of velar tissue on top of that bulb, and those would be yellow as well, because again, that, uh, that universal veil is yellow. In this is the western form, and it's uh, bright and flabby bulb veil. Flabby means yellow, and, and bulbator refers to the bulb. So it also has a yellow uh, bulb. You can see the, the patches here in these immature ones, they're still looking pretty yellow. As they get more mature, they kind of like it. But you can see a yellow ring on the uh, outer edge of the, the ring uh, there as well. So these occur from Rocky Mountains to the west. Um, sometimes you can get lucky and see all three colors together, uh, red, yellow, and white, believe it or not. 
So um, some other things to note with these, besides the big fat basal bulb, there's always three or four rings mm -hmm. of velar material on the top of the bulb. And I point this out because, again, if you find an M&I muscaria around here that's white, or a whole patch of white ones, it's still muscaria, it's just the white form. But, it, but you can tell because of the velar material. The other thing is, um, all these species, I better back up here, all the species in subgenus Ammonitis, so this half of the screen, all the species on this half, in, in, in all three of these sections, will have a striate cap margin. All the species on the right side in subgenus Lepidella will have no striations on them. This makes it easier to determine, like, uh, white destroying angels from white other species of Ammonitis. So and in fact, in these specimens here, you can see the straight cap margin here. It's not as easy to see on here and here because they have these scales. But you can see there's no scales here, you can see the structure. Okay, and so I pointed out how these structures come about by the expansion of the cap and the breaking of the veil and all of this sort of thing. Uh, one other one to note, this is the, the European Ammonita muscaria which is a slightly different shade of red, super common in Europe, but it's also becoming super common all over the world as well. It's highly invasive. It seems to be able to jump onto all sorts of other native species. And we even now are starting to see it in North America. It's gotten established in Alaska. There's even a population of it in California and a population, I'm told, in Massachusetts. So it'll probably spread. It's kind of hard to tell this guy from our North American native Red species of Ammonite muscaria. So, uh, you know, we won't necessarily know if one uh, outcome beats the other. If you travel to Australia, New Zealand, South America, Africa, pretty much everywhere in the world, you'll see this mushroom now. But it's native to uh, sort of the Eurasian parts of the world. It's spreading all over the place. Okay, so some other uh, muscarioid and, uh, and panthenoid types. This is what the pantherina type Ammonitis look like in the Midwest and East. They're not that real dark chocolate brown with white scales like you see in Europe. They're more of a, a tan color, light brown, cream, even almost snow white. They can be a fairly light color. So what makes them a panther? How would I know I had a panther Ammonita that's cream color when I thought that they were supposed to be dark chocolate brown like I see in the European books? Well, they all have one thing in common. All the pantheranoid types have a special type uh, a basal ball, and instead of a bunch of rings of material, they most often have one single really big ring. And this picture doesn't show it that well. This is what we call the Uh but this picture shows it a little better. A real just nice discrete round ball and a single sort of like collar of material. Almost like if you took your socket and rolled it down, it'll be a very prominent sort of collar of tissue. They call it a, a cothernate uh, basal ball. And so the uh, species like Rushaloides out here, Multisquamosa, uh, and the Jameda groups, they'll all have uh, this sort of structure. So, in fact, here's uh, Ammonite Velatides here. This is pretty common in the East. This picture was taken in Wisconsin. You can see this really prominent collar here. It's not just rings of tissue that are kind of loose on the, on the bottom of the stalk. It's actually like a, a big collar. Tom Bolt calls a coconate base an ant racetrack because you know, ants can actually get in there and, and go around and around and maybe not find their way out. <laughs> Possibly. Okay. Tom Bolt has a lot of fun ideas. So that's one of them. So that's the line of the, oh, you can see the uh, uh, stripe, slightly striped cap margin here. This is Emma Rachel Ladies. Uh, when this was named by Charles Horton Peck, I guess he thought this looked like a Rachel. Maybe. Anyways, it has a nice discrete basal bone and sort of a, a coconate base as well. One other thing about Rachaloides is uh, there's a few pictures of it in the book to illustrate that it absolutely has a ring because lots of books say this this one, even though it's in section Ammonita, you know, doesn't have a ring, which they're all supposed to, whereas like the vaginata types don't. Well, it definitely has a ring. It's just a very, very delicate ring. You can see here's the ring, and it falls off the mushroom or collapses on the stock really quick. So oftentimes you only see a ring on it when it's uh, a little tiny baby mushroom. <coughs> and if, if you have a whole bunch of them lined up, uh, you know, almost none of them might have a ring, except maybe one has a little bit of a hint of a ring. So I'm going to rush away. Okay, moving on to the Caesar group. Uh, this group is uh, oftentimes some of the more uh, popular 
questions for people to use in slideshows and pictures and in books and stuff because they're just so beautiful. A lot of very colorful mushrooms and often quite large and also some of the really popular edible species. So in fact, if, you've, uh, if you're a beginner and you've been in this club for only a short period of time, you've probably already heard, you know, never eat ammonitas ever just because it's too risky. Well, again, it's pretty easy to know the dangerous species from the safe methods. Having said that, people die every single year. So it's not something to be taken too lightly. But again, uh, the Caesars, the most uh, famous one is the Caesaria, I mean, uh, the Caesarea of Italy. Everyone knows the Italians are cuckoo about King Bolites, the porcini mushrooms. They're way more cuckoo about the Caesars. So if you see them in markets, the price on uh, porcini mushrooms, the King Bolites, pretty high, but the Caesars are always a lot more because that's the most popular mushroom. So the other thing about mushrooms, about wild mushrooms and ammonites in particular, that uh, clubs will inform you is um, don't eat ammonites and absolutely don't eat any wild mushrooms raw. The main way that, that Caesar ammonites are eaten is raw. And it's uh, so-called bouillie style uh, seen here. So Italians will take the buttons, slice them kind of thickly and put them on a, just a very plain salad and drizzles of olive oil and squirt or two of lemon juice and some coarse salt and that's it. They're extremely fragrant that way. I don't know if anyone's ever eaten mushrooms like that, but it's one of my favorite mushrooms. So here's a picture, a couple pictures uh, taken of, of me in the kitchen. These were taken by Gary Lincoff. We were doing um, the mushroom fair in Los Angeles quite a few years ago. And one of my favorite of all the Caesars in North America is this Ammonita vernicochera. It's the spring Caesar. It's a very light colored Ammonita, it looks very much like a death cow, and they can occur at the same time. Of course, there's a way to, there's a few ways to tell them apart, but to the you know to the untrained eye, they at first glance look very similar. Anyway, so I had a whole bunch of really big ones in the kitchen. You can see I was cleaning up, and we're going to make this a bully salad for a bunch of members of the LA club that were invited over. And naturally, Gary being Gary, um, he's whispering kind of extra loudly. I don't know about this one right here. I, are you sure? Wait, look, look at this feature here. And so, of course, I, I see as I'm scrubbing over my shoulder, these heads like start popping <laughs> around the corner looking in the kitchen because people are getting kind of panicky. And um, they, all, they all definitely uh, consumed the Caesar salad, but they definitely did not take the first bite. Gary and I had to take the first bite. <laughs> and they, they said, you know, so of course, when, with the King Bolites, when you have really small buttons, this is also my favorite way to eat them as well. Uh, raw, like shaved really thin on a salad, and they're extremely aromatic, and it's really nice. Mushrooms, of course, have a lot of fiber, so you don't want to eat a tremendous amount of them raw, because like eating anything raw, a lot of vegetables or fruit, of course, there's a lot of fiber, and you can get the upset stomach. But it doesn't mean that they're toxic, it just means that there's a lot of indigestible fiber. Right? So in the book, we have pictures of different lookalikes, and there's a number of things that look like uh, the death cap mushroom, and so here's some of those burner cookers that were picked uh, alongside the death caps. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, pretty, pretty similar. Would you risk your life? So um, I'm not going to tell you which one's which. So, so, but one way to tell is if you slice them in half, all the Caesar ammonites are hollow in the center. And in fact, when they're very young in this egg stage, this hollow part is even filled with kind of this uh, weird like jelly. The uh, death caps and the destroying angels are solid in the center. And in fact, we have one up there. You can uh, slice it in half if you want to see what it looks like. So the Caesar in Italy that I showed you in the stall there, that's Ammonita Caesarea. Really, really old books will call our Eastern Caesars by that same name, but we have uh, more modern names for that. So our Caesar we now call Ammonita Jacksonii, very pretty orange to kind of tomato red mushroom with uh, yellow gills, yellow ring, and a yellow stalk. And if you look closely, even orange on top of the yellow on the stalk. We have some other Caesars that don't have a name yet, that don't have that orange color, that are possibly even more common, so be on the lookout for those. But anyway, so this is sort of the classic Caesar. Very prominently striped cap margin too, and the cup at the bottom is very prominent and persistent and always white. All the Caesars, the cup is always white, which contrasts really well with the rest of the mushroom. So not all of the Caesars are uh, orange and red. We have yellow Caesars in the east, like Ammonita arkansana and Cahokia. Again, it still has the white cup at the bottom, and this is also totally edible, uh, safe edible mushroom and delicious. 
and they can get quite massive. Here's a picture taken from uh, the Mingo Quarry a long, long time ago. This is a what, old, old mushroom named Leland, and uh, he's uh, deceased now. But he had this thing, and it was like 14 inches across, mm -hmm. great big, massive. You can see these are uh, pretty cool. Um, but a lot of our other Caesars are not so brightly colored. Here's one to be on the lookout for, for sure. This is Ammonite Marilliana, not very commonly seen. Uh, a mushroom that every once in a while, like every third or fourth year, up at the Northwood Spory, there's a spot where I find one of these, which we call the Seely Caesar. Um, Rod Tullis sequenced it and said, for sure it is not Ammonite Marilliana. It's an undescribed species, but I still think it probably is, but anyway, this is what we always look for at uh, the Northwood Spory. It's a great big honking Caesar, but you can see it's not a brightly colored one. It's, it's more grass. It occurs with sandy areas with black up. Uh, we have some other yellow and bronze type Caesars, so don't confuse things like Arkansana and Cahokiana, which uh, do occur this far north. Don't confuse them with this really common one here, uh, and that of NMGA. Came from areas of the Benning, who was a long time member, a long time ago in the Minnesota Club. I talked to them, believe it or not. So these are known as the bronze Caesars. We have several species that are more kind of orangey bronze colored on the top, and then the yellow gills and the yellow stuff. But uh, you should be able to separate those from the bright yellow and the bright orange Caesars. And not all the Caesars are massive. I, I keep saying how massive they are, and I've, I've totally forgotten. Some are super tiny, and you'll probably never see them, even though they're super common, because you don't look for tiny mushrooms. I mean, nobody does. So, um, oh, this is, a, I think maybe I have another next slide. Maybe I don't have it here. This is one we found uh, today at the rest stop, Ammonite spray gun. This one has kind of a weird cup that flares. It's very small, often falls apart. It's this weird flaring cup. And the habitat for this guy is usually on the margin of woods, kind of out just a few feet in the grassy area. That's literally the only place I ever see them. And they're fairly common. It's called the hated Ammonita. Uh, I think people gave it that name because it looks so much like a death cap. I, I don't really know. My co-author in the book, he has another theory which I'm um, going to need to bore you with, but it's known as the hated Ammonita, uh, it's a common name. And this is another one we see about every other year at Northwoods, right out back of the great big lodge where we have the displays and everything, right on the uh, on the grass as you get near the woods over by the lake. And they're really cool to see. They're usually not one or two, there's usually lots and lots of them, they can get pretty big as well. Okay, so what is next? The grisettes. So this is uh, Ammonita section vaginati. These look a lot like the Caesars, but again, won't have a ring. They're often more tall and more slender. Some can be pretty massive, uh, but no ring. There's some that are colorful, but most are not. Most are more drab colors, grays and browns, but uh, in their own way, they're very pretty. This is just arguably one of the prettiest ones. This is the Tawny Grisette. Uh, and then a full one, this is color. And this was, picture was taken on Madeline Island uh, where we quarry at the North Coast Park. You can see very prominent uh, straight margin too, and just a really pretty tall uh, slender mushroom. Also totally edible. Everything in this section is also edible, believe it or not. And it bears repeating about the business with the uh, partial veil collapsing on the stalk, so there won't be a ring, but there is a partial veil. As we go through these, just take a look at the stalks of some of these. And so there's different colored material in the stalk Sometimes the stalk appears to be all one color, but if you hold it just right, we have some on the table back there, you'll notice a different sheen or the partial veil material is on the stalk. So it's kind of a, a shaggy looking appearance. That it might be like. So sometimes they have a saccate vulva and sometimes not. If you don't know what a saccate vulva is, that's a saccate vulva. So the big giant boot, this is Pachypolia uh, from the West Coast. And this has maybe the biggest of all the uh, bulbs of any note. Isn't that pretty cool? Who would want to see a mushroom like that? So out here in the Midwest, we have uh, the so-called grisette, or Ammonita vaginata, which is probably a group of lots and lots of species. The, the true Ammonita vaginata, nobody really knows what that is. It's probably something in Europe. We have lots and lots of gray colored vaginatas that, that go by that name, so it's probably more correct to say Ammonita vaginata group. And there's really no way you're going to figure out which one you have. Scientists will never figure it out. I mean, you can only tell them apart by doing DNA sequence analysis and uh, 
really wants to bother with that company. But uh, one thing to point out is, uh, besides being kind of gray or gray brown, no ring, very prominently striped cap margin on most of these species is the stalk. This one, the stalk is white and the partial veil is white, but you can quickly tell that there's different material from the partial veil stuck into mm -hmm. the stalk. Uh, this is a real pretty one, and this one is in, uh, on the table outside. I'm at Aracopas, the snake skin grisette, and you can see this beautiful gray material on the stock. It's one of my favorite ones, super common around here right now. Um, you can see it on, on lawns and urban areas, as well as parks, etc. But notice the gray color, it's almost black, actually, when it first starts out in this very young. A little baby specimen we have back there, you can see where the velar material uh, just snapped free from the stalk. It almost looks like there's a ring because the material is still stuck on there. It'll, you know, tomorrow it will probably fall off. But it's really striking to see. They're just so pretty. Look at the gray brown mushroom. Look, these so pretty, but I always like to see them. They don't have really much of a cup. The bulb on the bottom basically falls apart. It's just flakes of material and often is left behind in the soil. And this is that Tommy Grisette that I showed as the first picture of this group. They usually occur very deep in forests and even in uh, almost swampy areas where it's kind of mossy, but super common, not that commonly seen. When you see a swampy area, you're like, well, I'm not going there, because why would I? There's no mushrooms in a swamp. Well, of course there's mushrooms in a swamp, just maybe not that many types of species. Uh, but you can be treated because these can be a very light color with just a little bit of kind of orange brown in the, in the central part, or they can be very dark chocolate brown. And a lot of people actually collect and eat these I don't really see the point because they're kind of uh, thin and flimsy and not much to them, but uh, they're really pretty to see. And uh, we'll be seeing lots of them next week at the North Coast Park. So here's something that looks pretty similar, although it's easy to know this species from the Tawny Grisette. This is Sinicoflava. Sinicoflava means like Chinese yellow, is how it gets the name because it looks like curry color. It's kind of a yellow green color almost, with a little brown mixed in. Um, and usually uh, a patch of velar material on the top of the cap, the cup on the bottom of the mushroom is gray. So it's easy to know Sinicoflava, which is a very common mushroom from all the other grisettes because of this gray cup uh, at the bottom. And if you do see gray on your cup of, of your mushroom that's about this color, you very well could have a, a different species. That's actually quite rare. So pay attention to whether or not it has an umbo at the top, that's like a bump or a nipple almost, or if it's just round like this guy is here. So I know I didn't see nipple, but you'll for sure see lots of this one. It's very, very common. A lot of people don't know the name of it, but it should be better. Than so here's one to be on the lookout for that's not very common. It's, it's probably, or at least not commonly seen. It's probably quite common in Minnesota. It occurs, to my knowledge, only with red pine. So if you go to red pine plantations, Sometimes the diversity is not so high in there, people skip them, but there can be some neat mushrooms that fruit with red pines, including man on horseback and this guy here. This is a like subniger. Very dark brown color mushroom in the vaginata group. Uh, pretty nice prominent cup on the bottom that gets these ochre colored stains. And we, we would be teased with one or two specimens of this every once in a while at the Northwoods Foray, and then we finally found a spot where they occurred. And, we were able to get good big pictures and even figure out what this one was, which is kind of cool because there's not that many records of it. So uh, back to that Sinicoflava with the gray cup. If your mushroom looks like Sinicoflava with the gray cup, but has, as I mentioned, this nipple at the top, and the cap is sort of zoning, so there's like dark, light, dark, light colored, and it very well could be this undescribed species, which we call Shawama Gamentis. Just because that's fun to say, Shawama Vanensis. It's from the Shawama Van Nicolay National Forest. And we only know it from the Northwoods Forest. But we see it there every year with great big mature white pines. But I'm sure it probably occurs over here as well because there's lots of great big white pines. So we have to look out for something like this. It would be nice for scientists to know the range of this guy. So here's some other pictures of it. You can see again the zoning uh, brown cap that looks like a bullseye. And every once in a while, you'll see sort of a gray colored one. And this is a different species. So how do we know this is different from this one? Uh, spore size is different. Cap color is not the same, but also look at the cup on the bottom. This one's always gray, always, always gray. This one's white with uh, ochre stain. So this one doesn't have any sort of anemia. We call it M-Mayo species WI02. Um, 
Based on sequence analysis, Rotellus thinks this is the same one that is also known for one place in New Jersey called Jakesland, New Jersey. So unfortunately, he calls it Evanida jakeslandensis, which is kind of a dumb name. It's so, much <laughs> so it's not officially published, so you can actually describe it and call it something else if you want. Call it Minnesota. You can call it Minnesota Nicaea. Uh, okay, one other one to look out for. Um, here's another one that's actually probably quite common around here, and almost no one ever sees it because it occurs only with big cottonwood trees. And big cottonwood trees are often in places lawns and parks and along rivers that get inundated with water and flooded and of course the mushrooms are going to occur there because it gets flooded and it's underwater except that there are mushrooms there and this guy is a pretty common one and it's a great big very light colored caesar and john was shaking his head anyone else ever seen these before only with cottonwoods yeah no and it's a big it's an edible one and when it fruits it often fruits in complete confusion so this will be good for people to define and determine the range of this we do know it occurs from uh, much of the Midwest all the way into to Colorado and at least as far south as Kansas and probably Missouri and even south of that. And here it's kind of an early mushroom. Yeah, it is pretty, it is, it can be very early, but it can also uh, be fruiting still at this time. I know uh, Mike Wood uh, came from Minnesota to the Northwood Square just a couple years ago and he brought a great big one. He's like, what is this? Well, like, you never seen that before? And he's like, we live in California, we don't have these things. So, yeah, that's popular fun. Pretty cool to see. Have you ever eaten it, John? It's too dangerous. Or just never eat an amanita. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say. There's old mushroomers and bold mushroomers, but there's no old bold mushroomers. <laughs> okay, so oh, so here's some little dudes. So um, in fact, this slide, these are little Caesars. This got mixed in with my vaginatus. So sorry about that. These are, you can tell they're Caesars because they have little things on them. Anyways, this is, I have a Pachysperma and Virginiana. Look how teensy they are. They're just millimeters in size. Uh, there's other small species too. There's a little tiny vaginata. I have no idea what the species is, but I brought it in. Uh, that, that was seen on the rest off. There were lots of them there. They're just a couple inches tall. They're super pretty. It's a type of thing you would overlook because, you know, you're walking along and you're about to see it, but then you see this big destroying angel over here and you're like, oh, okay, there's that one. Just walk right by. But these are fully formed mushrooms, and the weird thing is, Ammonita pachysperma, this guy here, is one of the tiniest of all Ammonitas, but yet it has the largest spores of all Ammonita species. Isn't that weird? The tiniest one, and nobody, of course, knows why it has these kind of uh, spores, but that's just the way it is. Okay, oh, and one last one to show. So, in the Vaginata group, all across North America, we have these weird white forms. And we see these at forays all the time in the east, in the midwest, uh, out west, in the southwest, west coast. And they usually go by the name Ammonita alba. You know, alba means white. And there is a European species that's called Ammonita alba, and it looks just like this. But, you know, there's no way we're seeing with hundreds of different types of trees and different habitats all across North America. There's no way they're all the same thing. They're probably all different species that nobody's bothered to look at. So if you find stuff like this and you have someone that does DNA sequence analysis or knows how to dry stuff and voucher it and send it to somebody, all of these sorts of things would be really good to figure out what we have because they're pretty easy to know which group it belongs to. We know it's sex. I mean, look at it. It's obvious. Which species we just don't know. So one of these pure white ammonitas, no ring on the stalk, you know, some sort of a cup at the bottom and, and straight margin on the cap. So we know it's not a destroying angel, nothing like that. What species it is, and nobody knows. So they go by the name of Racetabula, which means uh, clean slate, and it goes by the name of Homoli, named for Dick Homola, a famous mycologist up in the Northeast, and some other names too. But again, we don't really know too much about them. So um, uh, mycology is one of the areas where you know amateurs, people that are not like you know lab scientists, can make big contributions to science and even discover new species. Um, all of the larger clubs in North America, all of the larger mushroom clubs in North America, I know at least one person that's an amateur in the club that's discovered a species unknown to science, mm -hmm. you know, including my daughter who is seven. So it can happen. So if you make good observations and take notes of habitat and, and, and keep the specimens and dry them, too, maybe you can make a, 
really great contribution. Who knows? Okay, so of course you can't talk about Ebenezer without talking about without talking about the section of phalloidae. This includes the dangerously poisonous mushrooms. These guys are for the most part all white, except for the death cap, which is not native to North America and we don't have here. All of our death caps are completely white. If you see how they develop, they end up uh, leaving a pretty prominent cup on the base of the stalk, and this is why. When the universal veil breaks, most of it's left behind on the stalk. Maybe be a small patch of velvet material on the top. Sometimes people call that a skull cap. There's usually not little scales or anything. It's usually one piece or no pieces. The margin of the cap will not be striking. There is a partial veil that results in a ring. In all of our species, except for death caps, the entire mushroom will be white. The cap, the gills, stalk, ring, cup, everything will be all white. They often have kind of a weird smell, kind of a foreboding uh, chemical smell. Um, other than that, that's about all the, the features there are. And they're really striking to see. Often they're quite large and they're the whitest white. So they're really beautiful to see. It's just not something to eat. Um, but they're not so dangerous that you can't handle them, put them in your collecting basket, etc. I point this out because all of the time naturalists or other people will be like, they're so dangerous, you have to wear gloves, you shouldn't touch them, you shouldn't, you know, cast your eyes upon them or think about them. They're just so dangerous. And that's that's ridiculous. They absolutely kill people every year, but you can for sure handle them. You can for sure smell them. John probably see me. I will often take a taste of them. It's totally fine to take a taste. In fact, they taste really, really good. And this is the problem. With a lot of poisonous plants and other organisms, poisonous insects and bugs and stuff, they have antifeedants in them that are extremely bitter or taste awful or whatever. Mushrooms are not necessarily like that. And especially not the other They actually taste totally fine. There's no way to know by smelling, tasting a little bit. You prepare the meal, the meal still tastes fine. There's no way to know that what you're eating is about to kill you because it tastes totally fine. So there's no point is there's no warning, colors or smells, nothing aposomatic, as biologists say, about them. There's been like reds and yellows in nature on the snakes and fish and bugs and stuff. Those are warning colors. Mushrooms don't do that. There's no dangerous red or yellow mushrooms in North America that I can think of. All the dangerous ones are usually white or kind of drab colors or brown, often fairly small, except for the other night and they're quite dark. So you just have to know uh, what the mushroom is. There's no way to tell them. But you can certainly put deadly ammonitas in your basket with your edibles side by side. They might drop spores on them. It doesn't matter. So the same. There's no poison in the spores. So as long as you don't mix up when you're dumping them on the table, what's what, and then cook the wrong thing, you're totally fine. So here's the death cap, and again, this is native to Europe, but it's come to North America a couple different times, so now it's very common all up and down the West Coast and all up and down the East Coast. It was just confirmed this year to be in Idaho, so it's moving inland, and I'm sure it will show up here at some point as well. Now, all the books always say, uh, about the color business, it's yellow, you know, kind of a yellow green chartreuse color. So I purposely showing this picture here because this was taken in the Bay Area. The entire hillside was covered with thousands of ammonita uh, phalloides fruiting. This was a great big cluster, and I literally grabbed a bunch that were growing all together side by side. You can see the color variation from ones that were literally growing next to one another. They can go from like white to cream to chartreuse, even dark bronze, they can be very dark color. The books also always say they never have a, a, any velar material on the cap. Every book says that. That's of course ridiculous, you can see the, the cap here. So that's not a good indicator either. You just have to kind of know uh, what, what they look for, look at all the features combined. Around here, this is what our destroying angels look like. Going to be all white. This is the Bisporigera. This is the guy that mostly gets attributed with poisonings, even though it probably isn't really the one that's doing it. Truly, by sporogyra, which means it has two spores per, per basidium, you can tell this microscopically. But just by looking at the mushroom, you can usually tell by sporogyra. It's usually a, a pretty small destroying angel, just a few inches tall, kind of spindly, and it's, it's probably not collected all that much. In the Midwest, we probably much more likely collect things like this big group here. I'm going to sub LEs here. This is the most common one in, in Wisconsin based on my collections, and it might be the most common one here. Having said that, the one that's out there is not this one, but uh, 
if you're if you're destroying angels, a great big giant thing like a foot tall, it's probably this big. I'm still dead. This picture was taken at a, a wayside area in Wisconsin, and waysides are really cool because they have all kinds of different trees, a lot of oaks, and they mow the grass, and it's, it's easy to see uh, what's there. Patrick Leacock and I, uh, this is one of our favorite wayside areas until they cut all the trees down inexplicably, and now it's But well, one time I stopped there, do a quick check around the trees. There's this guy running around with a great big basket. And these were in the basket and a lot of others. And I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just saw these. As I was driving by, they look really good. I'm like, yeah, what are they? He's like, I don't know, but I'm going to take them home and eat them. I'm like, oh, no. so, I'm like so you know how uh, very oftentimes you'll run into someone in the woods that says, oh, you better watch out because those are poisonous. And you don't know if the guy really knows what he's talking about. I'm like, I'm going to assure you, I know what I'm talking about. These mushrooms will kill you if you eat all of those, for sure. If you eat one of them, they'll probably kill you. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, you, here's how to know what this is. Don't ever eat any mushrooms that look like this. Basically, a white mushroom with a cup. He's like, I had no idea, but they just look so good. I'm like, no. I'm like, if you want to take them home, if you don't want to believe me, I mean, you can take them home. I'm not trying to spike your mushrooms. But anyway, so we laid them out here, and I took a photo, and I took off, and I don't know what happened next. Maybe he did take them back up and take them. Who knows? But anyways, um, really common mushroom and they get really large. But uh, the problem is we have a lot of different, uh, we have several different destroying angels and they all pretty much look the same. A uh, white mushroom with a white cup. So we can separate some from another by doing a couple things. Microscopy is one, frankly I don't have the time for it. So one thing you can do is a chemical test. If you know someone in your club that has chemicals like potassium hydroxide, you can squirt potassium hydroxide on your mushroom and some of them uh, will change lemon yellow, like these two species here that otherwise look the exact same, but sometimes they won't. So here's two different, a collection of two different species of destroying angels. That big cell Aliacea is here, that's yellow, and then this other one, and then I look those sperma, is this one, and this one, and this one. You can see where the dropper of the KOH was kind of dabbed or scraped on the cap and turned it yellow, but where it was dabbed on this one, and on this one, and on this one, no so this is one thing you can do to separate some of the species. Of Admittedly, there's not a good way to know um, all of them, but this is one test you can do. And the, and the book mentions some other things. One thing to know, though, is that they all have this amatoxin. So this is the most notorious uh, toxin in all the ammonites. So what's going on here? This great big uh, ring structure that these mushrooms produce, nobody knows why they produce it. it maybe it's a precursor chemical to making other things. It's tough to know. It's deadly poisonous to mammals and really not a lot of other animals. Most books will say it's deadly to all forms of life. That's preposterous. It's deadly to, to, to mammals and probably not all mammals. It seems maybe squirrels and, and some other mammals can eat them and maybe not be harmed. Nobody really knows uh, for sure. For sure, humans uh, will be killed by eating mushrooms containing this, this poison. Oh, yeah. And uh, bad taxonomy kills. This was a, a sign made by a uh, a mushroom dribble long term ago. It's very fitting. So how to know if your if your mushrooms have this poison or not, and without you know feeding them to your dinner guests, because I mean that's an obvious way to know, but that's also <laughs> probably a bad taste. Well, there's tests to know if your mushrooms have this toxin, and they've been around for a long, long time. This test is called the Meissner Wieland test, and it requires having newsprint here and concentrated uh, nitric acid. And it's kind of a pain. It doesn't really work too well, but it's been around for decades. Um, lo and behold, a brand new test was just developed a couple years ago by a scientist named Candace Beaver in, in California. And so she developed a test that basically uses antibodies, much like a paternity test or, well, there's, there's lots of tests that look like this. I can't think of another one off the top of my head now, but there's probably other tests that look like this. It looks like a COVID test. <laughs> you had to say it, didn't you? Of course. Throw him out at once. So yeah, it works by the same principle. It's extremely sensitive. And so this test wasn't developed to test your mushrooms, because that's ridiculous. You should know ahead of time what your mushrooms are and not poison yourself. This test is actually to be used by hospitals to know if someone got poisoned, because it's so incredibly sensitive, you can detect a super tiny amount of the toxin in urine and blood. So naturally, I skeptical. So I've done the test a few times with mushroom clubs, and man, is it cool. In 
fact, it's so sensitive that if you have one person handling the mushroom or the knife and handling anything else, you'll contaminate everything. It's so crazy sensitive. Wow. So we use this test um, uh, for this test here. I think this was at a foray last year in Louisiana, I want to say. So we had Ammonitis subaliacea, this big destroying angel that you would find around here. And oh, and I had white specimens from the west coast of Ammonite Ophiata. I just happened to have deadly, <laughs> it's a funny story. I happened to have deadly Ammonitis <laughs> dried in my drawer at home, <laughs> just for kids. <laughs> um, and everyone's left to pull them out for tests like this. And we also had some other ammonites that were collected on the same quarry, some of which look kind of like uh, dangerous ammonites, and some not so much like this Lavigia, uh, the so called false death cap. And then someone else brought dried uh, Gallorina marginata. Did you know this also has amatoxin? This is well known, books listed as being poisonous because it has amatoxin. So, as weird as amatoxin is, it's evolved more than once in mushrooms, so deadly Gallorina has that. Anyways, we did the test. Um, how you do this, you can use fresh mushrooms, I mean, you can use urine or blood too, but you can use fresh mushrooms or dried, and they give you these little epidorf tubes, these little microfuge tubes, a piece of the mushroom, fresh or dried, uh, so small you could fit it under your fingernail, put that in the tube, with <coughs> just a little tiny squirt of just plain water, and shake it for 60 seconds, then take three drops of that water and put it into the COVID test, I mean the amatoxin test. <laughs> And then wait one minute and you'll get your results. It worked astoundingly well. I've done it several other times. So, it works really well. so this is from um, amatoxtest.com, I think is the company. And uh, every time I do a lecture, of course, I mention this. And so uh, they've been so popular that they've actually sold out. And I guess they are going to be restocked here in like about a month or so. The neat thing about this is these things can sit in their little foil wrappers on a shelf at room temperature probably forever. They don't have to be refrigerated or frozen. The hospital could have one box of these and like once a decade pull out a test and determine extremely quickly if a patient's been poisoned by amatoxin and then do whatever treatment you need to do rather than just guess and like just observe them for 12 hours because then it's too late. You know, their liver's been uh, fried. So anyways, something to look into. Amatoxtest.com I think is what it is. And again, they're not terribly expensive. It's one of those things where you know, all clubs where destroying angels grow should probably uh, know about this. Okay, so um, I can finish up in like five minutes because I'm just about at one hour now. Uh, just a couple slides to show you a couple species of this free living group uh, in section Lepidelta. These are really cool. All these mushrooms are completely white, but they get uh, massive size, often have big roots on them or a big bulbous base, and they're kind of neat to see, and they're free living. So uh, just one note about that. So these lepidellas, again, real shaggy because they have these really weird uh, universal tails. So at the Illinois Club Foray, where's Patrick? Oh, I think Patrick said they found Nemonite abrupta, which has usually a very abruptly bulbous uh, stalk face, and it's a lepidella. Versus some of the other ones, which maybe have a deeply rooting face. Isn't this cool? If you found this mushroom and like this is just sticking up out of the grass or leaves and you cut it off, look what you'd be missing. You'd be missing all of this down here under the ground. Um, and then another one coming around here is one of my favorites, Ammonite sub cookeri, which has this wonderful smell of burnt sugar and these beautiful recurved scales on the stalk and scales on the cap and has a double ring. We want to see that. So this is another common species around here. And then it's the ground. And like the Canessin is also a, a fairly deep rooting species that looks kind of like an Ammonite of Asperia, but if you get around to digging, you'll see that it's got a, a deeply rooting stalk. And I guess maybe that's the last slide. So um, I'll end with my advertisement again. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Questions or yeah, yeah. Well, everyone that's hands up, they're like, oh yeah, you have time for my question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. I actually have a tall tale to share about poisonous mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, 
What happened? Well, a mutual friend found some mushrooms that he eventually wound up um, cooking and eating, or his whole family did. And anyway, um, his cat ate some of them too. And then the cat started going absolutely ballistic, like, like jumping like up way high. So the, they thought, uh-oh, these mushrooms are poisonous. We have to go to the emergency room to have our stomachs pumped. So they did. And then when they came back home, they found out that the cat wasn't poisoned. It was just pregnant and having kittens. <laughs> so, so wait, are you telling me they were all pregnant? The cat was, the cat was pregnant. Oh, see, I, I inferred the other. I inferred that the cat proved that they were not poisoned. They were all pregnant. Yeah, the cat wasn't poisoned, it turned out. It was just having kittens. That's so the cat. Yes, bro. Super, I don't know if you're aware, but the Amazon Toxic Cats we did at the house party is up on YouTube. And it's really great. He's awesome yeah. in the video. It's yeah, a 20 minute video. I forgot we did that last year. Yeah, and I yeah. think if you just go on YouTube and type in your name so, and Amatoxin test, it's the first thing that comes up. In fact, that's the one where I actually. Inadvertently contaminated everything. Yeah, so we're like, my that we had yeah, so like, okay, so everyone gets one thing, don't touch anything else, nobody touch anybody. And then, of course, it worked perfectly, but yeah, I was really astounded how sensitive it was. It's crazy. So, everyone, go home and watch that on YouTube. Very cool. It's on the Wisconsin Mycological Society YouTube channel. Yes, ma'am. Is the same as any other poisonous mushrooms, or those tests are good for any Okay, genus, yeah, so a good question is, is does it, will it work for any mushrooms, etc.? cetera? Um, yes, and here's also another note. I guess I didn't really mention, so within the seven sections of the genus Ambonida, three of the sections have poisons. The muscari, the muscari group, the muscari and the panthenoids, they have one type of toxin that's not deadly. You get very sick, but it, you know, it's not deadly. The lepidellas have a different type of toxin that affects the kidneys, also probably not deadly, but people get sick. And then there's the phalloidae group has a third different type of toxin, the amatoxins, and those are deadly. So uh, the phalloidae is the only group of amnitas that have that deadly toxin, just those few species. However, the amatoxins have evolved seemingly more than once. So we know some gallerinas have them, the deadly gallerinas. Also some lepiotas do. You know, if you're the type that likes to eat these really big uh, parasol looking mushrooms, those are totally safe. But some of the small species that are like the woodland uh, lepiotas that are quite small, white and shaggy, often have kind of an orange or orange brown disc in the middle. They're very pretty, quite the area, magnospore, etc. Those uh, may have emetoxin too. So anything that has emetoxin, you can test. It could be the mushrooms, someone's urine that's been, uh, that's, a, that's a victim, their blood, uh, a dog, their their blood or urine, presumably. So any, it'll detect amatoxin from anything. It's on your gloves and you contaminate everything. Uh, but the muscaria one. Muscaria would be negative, right? Yep. It was a little hard to tell in that picture. You had the, you had the one muscaria, and I couldn't see you really well. Yeah. Yes. Sure. So one bar is sure. deadly. One bar is deadly. Two bars is safe. Um, two faint bars here. I barely see the other. Yeah. I can see them here. Two bar and a bar. And then one bar here. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the story. Yes, Patrick. Uh, so, let go to sub incarnated is also group. Oh, yeah. Who knows about let go to sub incarnated? It's almost kind of has like lilac tone sort of on it. Kind of white, reddish lilac color. A little bitty guy can fruit the profusion of wood chips. Yeah, I've seen it in urban areas a lot, but that's also in that same group. Deadly. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. So the Chesarea group or the Caesar group yep. has no amatoxins. Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, every every species in that section is considered that same metal. Okay. And I've personally eaten many species of it in there. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. I've never, I've never, I mean, I, honestly, like, I, I've been foraging um, on the west coast and here for over 20 years, and I've always had a fear of anything that looked 
that will denominate us. Yeah. So now maybe I'll um, <coughs> try a pipeline. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. So everyone has this uh, stigma about eating amanitas just because there's deadly ones, and I mean, <laughs> for sure you shouldn't take it lightly. But you know, to me, most agaricus species look alike. A lot of Lepiota species look alike. So there's there's not dangerous agaricus species, but certainly a bunch that will poison you, make you sick. And people will pick them all and, oh, this one's turning yellow, this one's turning kind of reddish. Or well, whatever, they'll just throw them all in the basket. But so, you know, the point is it's it's very easy to know, uh, in my opinion, if, uh, one ammonite from another. People will be foraging in, in pastures on manure for what they think are psychedelic mushrooms. And, you know, I ate, I've heard this numerous times, I ate like 300 of this. It must not have that much um, psilocybin in it. Like, that's not a psilocybe species. They, they all look kind of similar, these small brown LBMs. That's not a psilocybe species. But you're lucky you didn't kill yourself because there are small brown psilocybe lookalikes that are deadly poisonous, you know? So, but the ammonitis, uh, you know, again, it shouldn't be taken too lightly, but it's, it could be overblown at the same time because you can tell them from another picture. Anybody else? I have some questions from Zoom. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I, I'm going to go. Geez, yeah, I hope I didn't have, say anything. We got about 50 people joining us from Zoom tonight. Sorry if you're um, out there. I forgot all about you. If I disparaged anyone in any club or <laughs> saying anything about anything, um, puffball lovers. I was only kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. I'm going to go in reverse order here. There's a couple of questions. I think um, Peter Pearson. What, what he mean? wasn't kidding. <laughs> what does it mean to stipe exannulate versus annulate? Oh, stipe question is uh, stipe exannulate or annulate? Stipe that's annulate has an annulus. Stipe that doesn't have an annulus or a ring, exannulate. Perfect. And um, another question from Diane is Are there any mushrooms that are too dangerous to handle? No. So here's another thing. So you can be sensitive to anything. That doesn't mean it's poisonous. So there are for sure people that have a bad reaction to eating more else. I feel badly for those people, but there are people that are, have a sensitivity to more else. It doesn't mean more else poisonous because they're not. I mean, most people in this room probably eat more else. And likewise, you can have a, a skin sensitivity to all sorts of different mushrooms. Sue Willis species very often cause uh, some sort of like an allergic reaction or sensitivity to skin, but so the species aren't poisonous, but there, you know, there can be a reaction to them. So there's some other mushrooms too that don't necessarily occur in North America. There's, um, uh, is it a Photostroma carnu gamme? It's a Photostroma, right? It's that red coral looking thing that's in Asia. That has a really strong reaction to skin, but I don't know that it's uh, deadly poisonous or and then there's some other questions about the um, Amanita muscaria. Um, one person was very interested in um, the stories about the origins of Santa and the reindeer eating them, which I know Ron does a really great presentation on. <laughs> and they're uh, very interested in. Um, She's talking about Ron Spinoza for the yeah. people at home. So, and Ron's in the, the crowd site. And Ron and I have, have co written this before. So, did you hear video? Yep, yep, no, Ron's here. Oh. Still, you still got a lot more hair on your face than the last time I saw you. That was before COVID. So again, sorry about that. So um, if you're interested in Ammonite of Ascaria lore and history and Santa and why is Santa red and white and is this true and all this, definitely get my book, uh, Ammonites of North America, the first like third of the book. It's all kinds of history on Ammonites and especially Ammonite of Ascaria. If you have the book and you already saw that section, it's Lots and lots of info on that. It would, awesome. it, would take, it would take a whole hour to explain. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole presentation on its own. There's yeah. another question about Amanita muscaria and um, people making tinctures from it, um, yeah. like for sciatica or nerve pain. Um, they said they've seen people using tinctures for pain relief or mm -hmm. um, Amanita dreamer. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, weaning off of opioid dependency. Mm -hmm. Um, so, question is about um, using Ammonite muscaria as a medicinal. So, I don't know that much about, about medicinals, but here's what. So, um, they are toxic. However, it's now pretty well known what you can do to make them, to detoxify them. So, you can just simply eat them. 
why would anyone want to do this? Well, I've done this before. It's actually a pretty decent edible. And if you find one, often you find like hundreds of baskets full. So you can have a lot of nice usable mushroom there. But again, they are toxic. So how to make them non-toxic, uh, usually the stem is sliced and tossed because they're kind of tough. The caps are sliced, you know, fairly thick and put into boiling water and boil for five to seven minutes or something like that, removed from the water. And a lot of people recommend even doing that a second time. And then what you're saying, oh, it's going to make the mushroom all flimsy and fall apart. Actually, they stay very firm, even kind of makes them even more firm. So they still have a very good texture. After the, the, the boiling for a few minutes, which removes the water-soluble toxin, you can then saute them in a skillet or whatever. They actually are, are pretty pretty tasty. You know, it's not the best mushroom, but it's certainly certainly better than puffball. Um, now, about the medicinal business. So, um, using ammonitis for psychotropic purposes, that's been around for a really long time. I wouldn't want to talk about that just because uh, they can make you sick, and I'm really into psychedelic mushrooms, but I don't bother eating them. I eat psilocybes because why not? They're easy to find, you won't get sick, and they're wonderful. As far as medicinal purposes like tinctures and things, this has become a hot thing just recently, or at least I just been hearing about it recently. And especially at Telluride this year, we had several uh, lectures by people talking about making tinctures. And unfortunately, I don't know too much about it. But um, you can check out uh, things that Trad Cotter has uh, presented, as well as his uh, partner, uh, Irene Dubin. Uh, she's one of the probably authorities, D U B I N. She's one of the authorities on making tinctures and things to remove pain from sciatica and a, a whole host of other things. Or um, who else gave some presentations? I don't know if Christopher Hobbs talked about it because I missed his talk. A lot of stuff happens at Telluride. We have, uh, we have 40 presenters, so. Uh, a lot of stuff's going on. But anyways, there's definitely places to look for, and unfortunately, I'm not the source to look for for information on tinctures. But it's it's popular and you can probably find it. Yeah, one more question, question about another question, if I might. Oh, sure, jump in. Yep. Um, um, after is um, right now in the question and answers. Uh, is this a long enough time to? Pick your brain about psychedelic mushrooms, or should I wait until I just after pick, the thing just is pick, over? Pick my brain afterwards, especially okay. when I'm signing a copy of my book uh, that you'll be buying for $40 here. If you're at home, you missed out on the bargain. So, yeah, that'd be a good time. Unless you have. All right, I'll buy a copy of the book and pick your brain. Okay. <laughs> One more question about any are there any local edible amanitas here that are worth pursuing? I think um, what I remember you talking about are the grisettes. That are local to our area? So people do eat the grisettes. I find them to be too skinny and flimsy to be of much count, frankly. Uh, our Caesars, which sometimes fruit in profusion, or the, the Jacksonii, you can find. The Populophila, which can fruit in profusion, they're a big chunky mushroom and, and again pretty common in local areas where there's lots of cottons. So that would be one that I would uh, give a try. And I, I've only eaten that one a raw, like taking a bite of it just to see if it had pleasant taste or not or whatever. I've never actually cooked up batches of them just because it, it, the opportunity hasn't presented myself. So, but they're around. Yeah. Thanks again.